they must go to their country. My family is from Osaka. I'm in my home and you come and tell me, go away. It was not a dream. He thought about it. And today in Uganda, the most successful retailers and, and, and the traders and real estate owners are Ugandans. President Amin was not the author of that policy. That policy had been there during the time of uh, President Obote. A boycott of Asian businesses uh, was taken up and it continued for two weeks. People did not buy from Asian shops. But somehow, that did not continue. And Amin felt that it is time to Africanize, and most African countries and after independence felt the same. Kenya felt a large number of Asians left Kenya in 1968. So um, he wanted to Africanize and hand over these small businesses, this economy to the uh, African people. What the government did not do, was not able to do, was to expel them. The, the Obote government lacked the courage to say, please, out. It was an issue that had been in consideration. Even Tanzania, President Nyerere, who disliked Amin and had refused to recognize Amin, applauded the move. Amin uh, issued a statement as the government spokesman to say, that he had gone to check the accounts of Madivani and Meta group of companies accounts in banks and he found only one shilling on the account. This is very bad. <laughs> in other words, he was justifying that argument that the people were, those people were just milking the economy of the country. Asian have kept themselves apart as a closed community and have refused to integrate with Ugandan Africans. Their main interest has been to exploit the economy of Uganda and uh, Ugandan Africans. They have been milking the economy of the country. There was a trade show in Moroto and this trade show was mostly agriculture and trade and whatever. The arrangement was excellent. It was superb. I mean, we went round and round all the stalls and they had I don't know what and it was so impressive. Well, after, after the show, he actually came and addressed us in that prison hall. So he praised the whole thing. He was so happy, was so impressed. He said what we, he saw, he couldn't believe it was done by Africans. What I, he said, it, he, so we, it, it is possible we can do all that. So he praised that show. After the supper and then the dance, you know he liked to dance, we danced. He had his accordion, <laughs> he also played accordion, you know. Then uh, he said, okay, uh, we are quite tired, we're going to rest tomorrow. I want to address you people again. I was a tutor, Moroto Teacher Training College. My house was not far from where he slept, he slept at the district commissioner's house, which was not far from my house. So at around three or four, I had the soldiers playing a band. I couldn't understand. The band was playing and running. So anyway, I, I, I slept. In the morning, I met army men. There were friends, army men in the Moroto barracks, to remember. So I asked him, uh, what, what I mean is, when is the old man coming? He said, which old man? He said, the president. Which, the president left. We said, you were left for what? 
He left for Kampala at around three or, or four. Then I said, ah, was that why the band was? He said, yes, that was the time he left. He left for Kampala. Then we hear on the news, the president stopped in Tororo and announced the departure, I mean the, the, the departure of the Asians. Half of the people who were expelled were Ugandan citizens, you know. I was born in Kampala, 1946, in a hospital at that time, which was known as Asiatic Hospital, in, on Nakasero Hill. I was born in Uganda, in Kampala, in 1960, and uh, we lived on Jinja Road, mm -hmm. above uh, Dichi Dobi at that time, that was selling um, Datsuns and Mercedes Benz. Yeah, so I had, I had my first 12 years in, uh, in Uganda. My father was born in Uganda. His grandfather actually came to Africa first. My father's grandfather. I was born in Uganda, and my son is born in Uganda. So we are four generation Ugandan Asians. My family is from Masaka. My entire family, including my father, were all born in Uganda. I grew up in Masaka for my primary school, my junior secondary school, then I came to Kampala for my O-levels. And I then moved to England for my university, and that was where I was in 72, when the mass expulsion of Asians occurred. My uncle, as you know, was born here since 19... 26 our family has been here and so we are Ugandans by by birth by citizenship by registration whatever you call it my father the late uh, Muljibai Madvani came to Uganda in 1914 he came here because his brother was here and uh, they started the businesses uh, basically trading the trading activities developed into looking at uh, doing businesses for manufacturing. My father was obviously quite enterprising, had a tremendous foresight. And um, all what our group is, the credit goes to him. Confused and frightened, the Asians organized to leave Uganda, the country they had helped to build. In fact, Uganda had become their own home because they had set up businesses and established families. Then people, you know, started asking questions that, what about the nations of this country? And then in that confusion, first they said the British should go. Then they said all the Asians should go. So, you know, even those who were nationals of this country had the nationality and the passport of Uganda, they didn't know what to do really. I had a shop on the Kampala Road. I had a boutique the shoe shop and the dress shop. I was running that shop and all, all of a sudden the president declared that he had a dream and the, all the Ugandan Asian, all people should live in three months, 90 days. It was early in the morning at about uh, five o'clock. People started making a lot of noise. You know. When strangers come, we used to, my favorite peacock used to stay outside my door, my bedroom door. In case of any disturbance, you know, he would be the first one to call. Mm -hmm. A knocked on my door and said, uh, some people wanting to see you. I said, who are they? He said, they're soldiers. I thought maybe it's on the last day of, of 90th day, maybe they want to take me to prison. <laughs> but didn't know what to do. So I took both of them and I came out, you know, uh, in my dressing gown. In 1848, I was in that house, you know, uh, my, uh, you see the porch, ten of them, like a 47 rifle, pointing at the door. Good morning, he said, good morning, sir. I said, what can I do for you? But I'm buried, you know, RCC, Papi Pombe. So I said, what had been? Some whiskey brandy, whatever you have in the house. Captain didn't drink. He was Muslim. He said, if you received President message, it came previous night, then I must quit also. History tells us that the majority left for United Kingdom because the British government 
was responsible for their coming to Uganda as laborers on the Uganda Railway. It was a sad moment. We didn't have any money. My father was a teacher with a small salary. He couldn't afford to buy tickets and we didn't know where to go to. But one of his friends gave him money. He said "You, to my father, you must protect your children. And my father said, I will stay. And my mother escaped with her children by train to Mombasa. And from Mombasa, it was a nine day journey to India, Bombay. The worst was when um, Mr. Manubai Madhvani, my brother, was locked in Makindi for nothing. And it was the, 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 the late Matthias Ngobi that called him. And he said, I think there's going to be problems. You better come. When and he was summoned to uh, the president. And I think that shock resonated in our faith of what was happening. Why should we, who have given everything to Uganda, part of Uganda, be discriminated? I studied at Kalolo Secondary School, and I remember clearly we were all part of the very um, sports group that used to go and play tennis and uh, hockey and basketball. And we were actually going for a tennis tournament when we were informed that Idi Amin wants all the Asians out of the country within 90 days. Uh, so we went home thinking we are citizens of Uganda, so it should not apply to us technically. But when we reached home and we started listening to the TV and the radio announcements, we realized that Idi Amin wanted all Asians, regardless of their nationality, out of the country. 26,000 Asians who were expelled were actually citizens of Uganda. And we had to go for verification of our nationality. So we took all our passports and verification documents to the immigration department and the officer just started tearing everything up and we were made stateless. That was a shock. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Such a shock. Mm -hmm. Total chaos. Uh, first of all, we couldn't understand. We were thinking it's a joke, you know, because how do you come to terms with it? You don't know. You think first that it's just a joke, it's not meant to, you know, it can't happen. But eventually then, when these announcements became legal announcements on the uh, air, on the radios and televisions, and you knew that was happening. And all of a sudden, uh, the stark reality when it hit, that was total chaos, I can't even explain. We were not prepared for it, we didn't expect it, we didn't know what to do. It was very dangerous for the girls, for everyone even. Girls were being taken away from the homes, homes where we've been looted. We couldn't go to school. That day I was at Makerere. I was at the university. We are in Mary Stewart Hall. These people came from town. Yeah, they, they were my men. And during that time we had Bazungu at the university, Asians and so on. We were almost going for lunch hour. The army men came and stood by the, the gate. Then he entered. They, they talked to custodian. They entered. When dining hall, they started pulling Indian, Indian girls out. They took them away. We didn't see them again. Actually, we really did not believe that this announcement was, was going to be uh, implemented the way it has been announced and not not even we but the whole world people thought the man was joking said that, that i think the man is joking now radio Uganda and utv started issuing a statement every day you are remaining with never 20 days you are remaining with 19 days you are remaining with 18 days until the point that the thing was real. Left with no choice and the love for their lives, the Asians painfully left their motherland and went to Europe and Canada, going without any property or cash. The only thing they were allowed to carry were the children they produced here. What could you take with you? All you could take was whatever clothes you could get into a suitcase. 
and they were going through everything that you had. So everything of value was taken from us. Mm -hmm. So we all we were left was with our clothes and things like that. Uh, so it was a it was a very traumatic experience. Indians were not happy. Even some went and threw some of their people or themselves in a water there, dying in water because of painfulness. They didn't want you to leave Uganda. And you know, as a 12 year old, this is a mixture of, oh my God, it's an adventure. Yeah, you know, it's an exciting time because, you know, we'd never been on a plane, for example. But I think the main thing is my father never wanted to leave Uganda. So he had never made any plans like some other families. Oh, he had to leave because you know, we had we were British uh, subjects, so passport holders. So there were 16 of those resettlement camps in, in the UK. So that was like the holding place. So the people went to the camps and you kind of lived in dormitories. You, there was no privacy. You shared everything. You had uh, <laughs> terrible food. And then uh, I went to school, which was a complete shock because it was nothing like Nakasera school. It was a big school and you could count the people of color in one hand. Um, they were kind of, I would say they were a little bit ignorant. They have no concept of the world. You know, they, everything is just like what they consume. Yeah, yeah, and I was used to, you know, very international outlook, you know. So, so they had very stereotypical views of what someone from Africa would be, you know. So A, they would think they were, you were Red Indians, you know, from the Wild West, from the cowboy movies. Or they would think you were, you know, from Tarzan, they would think you were living on, in the trees. So, you know, very, just kind of totally ignorant, that's all I can say. Not to say everybody was like that, of course not, you know. There's some lovely examples of uh, humanity and people being very kind and generous. They lived almost 80% of their properties here to Africans. They had to throw their money and jewelry in the Nile River and they had to get on the plane. So I was born in July of 72. By October, we were on the plane with one suitcase. And my mom still has a fear of them being taken, you know, to the... She still had... It's still traumatized and it's still in her mind that vision of being taken by gunpoint with soldiers onto that plane. Everybody has had left. My mom's side went to England, my dad's side came to Canada. We passed five army block. They were asked the questions, but we were so lucky that we passed through. When we went to Kenya, it was so difficult to get out of the airport because the Kenya people has refused that we don't want the refugees here, that we don't want the Ugandans here. What hurt them most was quite often the split of the family. You know, the son is in Sweden, the father is in London. Yeah, we didn't have the technology or mobile phones or Skype or anything like that that we could connect each other. We were separated for more than two years, put in various different countries as refugees. So we ended up in refugee camps in England. My parents and my younger siblings ended up in Malta. Uh, we had 10 children, so my parents with the younger children were in Malta, and then we, the slightly older kids, were um, in England. They went to Leicester. A lot of them went to London, mainly Wembley area and uh, Harrow area. Even now, a lot of the boroughs in uh, like Wembley, uh, they've got uh, about 50-55% of uh, population is Asians, you know. Upon arrival in the UK, the Asians started from scratch. Their story can only confirm that God is a God of fairness. Otherwise, one would wonder how they turned out to be so successful and enterprising more than the people they found. It's not easy, it's very tough. But I think in many ways, the welcoming attitude of the British government at the time made a big difference. They didn't feel that we are not wanted. The feeling of not wanted in Uganda was there. The feeling of wanting you in England was there. So you can see they might not be rich, but the good vibration of welcome in UK encouraged them. And um, you're right, the, 
very, very successful. My eye took 10 pounds. Most, they were not allowed to take more than 50 pounds. I like, I became a waiter in a wimpy bar. Yeah, I did that for two years. So many, many people had to do real menu jobs that never done before. The boys used to do it in the house. They became the house, house boys in England. In fact, David Cameron, um, when I was with him launching Conservative Friends of India, he said, um, uh, Ugandan immigrants is the best immigrants any country has ever had in the world. From small shops there, then they started, you know, building their empire. The children became very successful because of the hard work they did. Uh, schooling, they went to universities, and today you can see in, uh, in, uh, in the British government. You know, we have a second chamber, you know that, in London, okay. in Parliament. Oh, yeah, we've got nine parliamentarians of Ugandan origin. The, se the highest position in the cabinet after a prime minister's home secretary, she's Ugandan born, Priti Patel. Her parents came from here. She's UK born, but her parents came from here. My mother then started also working with my mother, was a housewife here. She started uh, washing dishes in the restaurant to meet the ends. I wasn't experienced, I didn't have any money. I had a little money, which the summertime I used to work in a restaurant, summertime and winter times. Mm -hmm. But I used to give all my money to my parents, you know. Mm -hmm. We were not allowed to keep any. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I kept a little bit and I had 1,000 Belgian franc. is like, mm -hmm. hmm. So I went to France, picked up the jewelry and some clothing and I started my business. Uh, I was 19 years old and I started a small boutique near the beach. You know, they came with the experience of on enterprise. Remember, there were shopkeepers or manufacturers or factories, all that. So, it, business is in the DNA. Okay? That's why they were very successful in England. When we reached England, I didn't even have a sweater. We reached there in November when it was cold. And I'd never been on a plane before. The, the best thing I ever did, you know, was to get a train. When we reach England, you come out of the airport, you get in the bus, take, takes you to a camp. Uh, the, some of the personnel came to meet us who had just arrived the night before. Um, they took us for breakfast. In the meantime, they also gave us a, you know, coat. Overall, um, I don't know who, whether it is brand new or second in, I don't even know. And then I met uh, somebody in the breakfast and they asked us when we came, we exchanged. Then one of them was, was traveling from, from, the, from the camp we were in, from Greenham Common to London. And he said, I'm going to London. I said, can you take me with you? He was very good. He was also an Asian refugee like me. And then I went to my auntie's house. We have about six people living in two bedrooms. So everybody was struggling in the meantime. I guess I had to find out where my father was. And uh, I met them. But then I, I stayed there for about two weeks. Um, then I told my father, look, I, didn't, I, I was not educated because I didn't finish my education. And I didn't want to work in a steel mill. So I told my dad, listen, I'm going. I'm going to tour around England and find a place where I'm going to settle. So I went to Birmingham, Manchester, uh, Macclesfield, Stockport, from there to Ilford in London, and then I ended up again in Finchley. So I, I started working in Finchley. And there was times that I would, I have two jobs. One would be working nights. I would be working at weekends as a taxi driver. And I would go to school from Monday to Friday. I'll sleep about four or five hours in, in between. And of course, once in a while when I was working, I would fall asleep. <laughs> Just imagine all that effort taken to another country. If the Asian community had not been banished, one would only wonder how Uganda's economy would be by now. I would imagine it would be at the level of Indonesia. Even what? nationals of Uganda. If they want to go, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are welcome to go. <laughs> that was the beginning of a real serious shortage of goods here. In my opinion, it seems Idi Amin realized that the communities were segregated. Ah, oh, those such knee was common and my father was skilled. 
if Madvani goes to jail, then everybody will go to jail. Idi Amin's motto was Uganda first. This and more in the next episode.